안녕하세요. 예, 대부분 멘토 만난 사람들 유진상입니다. 어, 오늘은 테라데이터 스테판 브록스트 어, CTO님을 모시고 어, 말씀을 좀 나눠보도록 하려는데요. 요즘 이제 빅데이터가 워낙 이슈화 되다 보니까 어, 이와 관련된 이야기들을 많이 나눠보려고 합니다. 안녕하세요. 금일 이제 기조 연설을 하셨는데 이제 그 주제가 이제 비즈니스 인텔리전스 에서 강가될 수 없는 네 가지 트렌드에 대해서 말씀을 해주셨거든요. 그래서 그 간략한 소개를 좀 부탁드릴게요. Sure, I think that the first trend people are experiencing their everyday life because sensor technology is uh, on vehicles, it's in homes, it's uh, starting to proliferate everywhere. So the point is that with the sensor technology, there's data being gathered that then wants to be analyzed. So the first trend is architect solutions that understand the scalability requirements and data requirements for sensor technology. The second trend is around pervasive business intelligence. That business intelligence isn't just for the corporate ivory tower, it's for everybody in the value chain. From the corporate executive officers, to the frontline analysts, to the call center reps, even to suppliers, distributors, and ultimately consumers. And I think we're going to have a very interesting evolution from business intelligence to consumer intelligence, where consumers are increasingly wanting access to data so they can make personal decisions. The third trend is related to in-database processing. In order to deal with the scale of data, in order to deliver higher performance, in order to have more agility, a lot of the processing is moving inside the database so that you don't have to duplicate data and move data around across a network in order to do advanced analytics. And we're seeing this trend in data mining, in online analytical processing, as well as in data integration. The last trend relates to non-traditional data types. In fact, sensor data is one of those types, but then I expand it to include things like social media and interaction data and from an architecture standpoint, we need to figure out how you're going to harness the value of data, not just the traditional relational data, but also the non-relational data. Big data is issue d in memory DB. In memory DB, in memory data warehousing, is a very important technology. I believe that in-memory is a very important technology for relatively small databases. The original use of in-memory for databases was mainly for transaction processing, where the data volumes are relatively small. And for you know, databases where uh, you can fit within the current constraints of memory with reasonable economic cost, it makes a lot of sense. And I, I believe that even for large databases, a small percentage of the data is accessed most frequently. So 80 to 90 percent of IOs should be done out of memory or out of solid state disk drives. But for very large amounts of data, it doesn't make economic sense to store all of the data in memory. Sometimes I hear people say, well, that the price of, of memory is coming down by 30% every 18 months, which is roughly true, and therefore memory will be cheap enough to store all the data and performance will be great. Would be true except that data is growing by at least 50% every 18 months. It means the data is growing faster than memory is getting cheaper. So it's economically irrational to think about putting all of the data, all of the big data, in memory. Now I understand why some vendors talk about this solution because it's easy, brute force, just put it all in memory. It could be very stupid software to do that. But you really want much smarter software, smarter software that figures out what data is accessed very frequently. We call that hot data. For that data, you want the lowest price per I.O. In memory and solid state disk drive is the best technology for the very hot data. But for the cold or warm data, you want the lowest price per terabyte, that's going to be electromechanical disk drives. So you want to simultaneously optimize for big data systems the price per I.O. and the price per terabyte. And that requires much more intelligence in the software to do this multi-temperature data management. So 100% in memory, not such a good idea, except for very small databases. But 80, 90% of the IOs in memory, absolutely a good idea. 
And then what we want is to be able to have the lowest price per terabyte for the remaining cold and warm data. I, I think that, you know, sure, memory is, is, is stable. That's not really the issue. Uh, it's really more the economics. How much can we afford to bring in memory? Uh, the memory technology is very stable. I think you've seen more movement in the solid state disk drive technology because one of the issues with SSD is that it wears out after many writes to the SSD. Uh, and so there's technology being developed to you know, have spare bits and to uh, swap when the parts are wearing out and to detect the wear out and so on. That technology is advancing in, in very interesting ways. So I think where you're seeing the most innovation is not so much in the in-memory, but in the solid state disk drive technology. I think the common theme that you'd see among most of those customers that are, you know, a petabyte and above is that instead of analyzing only the transactions, they're analyzing the interactions. Historically, data warehousing and focused on the lowest level of detail being a transaction, which is uh, some, some kind of a billable event. Like in telecommunications, a call detail record is the lowest level of transactional detail that records one phone call that I'm going to put on your phone bill. But a telecommunications company, if they're you know, in the petabyte club, they're probably not just doing transactions, they're probably doing interactions on the network. So the network data, all the interactions during the phone call on the network. The call detail record, in fact, is a summary of all of this interaction. In online retailing, for example, the transactions are what I bought, how much I paid for it, how I paid, and so on. The interactions are all the clicks that led up to the buy, all the search strings that led up to the buy. So again, it's order of magnitude, more information collected if you look at the interactions versus the transactions. The transactions give you the value of the customer, the interactions give you the experience. And so they're very valuable to understand uh, the, how to influence behavior of the customers, how to deliver better service to the customers, and which customers are likely to defect and so on. You need to understand the customer experience. That's really the common theme. In terms of the barriers, of course, the volume of data is 10, 100, 1,000 times bigger. And given that difference in, in, in size, you have to be uh, extremely economical in how you store the data. So we use very high density storage devices. We use extreme compression to squeeze the data down very hard in order to make it cost effective to store and analyze all of that data. And of course, you need scalability. And that's why Teradata is the leadership here because the other technology, they can't scale into this multiple petabytes. Uh, and, and that scalability allows the technology constraints to be removed so you can focus on delivering the business value. 지난해 디지털 미래를 디자인하자라는 그 보고서에서 빅데이터 전략이 필요하다라는 말씀을 하셨는데요. 그 빅데이터 전략이라는 게 이제 확안 와닿거든요. 그래서 이제 이 빅데이터 전략이 무엇인지에 대해 설명을 좀 부탁드리고요. 또 우리나라에 맞는 빅데이터 전략이 이제 있을 텐데 이제 각 국마다 좀 지역마다 조금 특색이 있기 때문에 그래서 우리나라에 맞는 빅데이터 전략은 무엇이라고 생각을 하시는지 좀 궁금합니다. I think that the main point of a big data strategy is that we need to collect the data from all the sources and have the capability to analyze the data to make better decisions. I don't think of it as a strategy for Korea. I think every organization has to make their own strategy depending on where their improvement opportunities are. So if I'm a telecommunications company, it probably involves getting the network data in addition to the call detail records and the billing history and so on. If I'm a retailer, it's the, you know, the clickstream data and the search data and so on. 
If I am business of banking, uh, then I'm interested in how people are using my internet banking site and all the, the transactions across all the channels, the ATMs and the branches and so on, and being able to combine that data and get the complete picture of the customer across all the channels and all the products and, and, and so on. So I think that the strategy has to be unique to each organization depending on where the business proven opportunities are. But the point is, get the data from all the sources, integrate that data, and then apply the advanced analytics to extract the value that aligns with your strategic goals. Big data 그래서 이제 어 빅데이터 하면 이제 흔히 생각하는 게뭐 많은 양의 데이터가 발생하고 뭐 소셜 네트워크, SNS 뭐 이런 것들 얘기를 하는데 이제 그런 이유 때문에 이제 그렇게 말씀을 하시는 것 같아요. 그래서 그 이에 대해서 어떻게 생각하시는지 좀 궁금하거든요. 그러니까 한국의 빅데이터가 맞는 실정이 있는지. Yes, I, I I don't agree with that. I think that uh, this term big data it's a bad name because it it makes people think that the volume of the data is the most important thing. Big means big size. But the bigness is the least interesting part of big data. The diversity of the data is much more interesting to me. The fact that you know, you're getting data in non-traditional form, in weblog data. I don't care how much data it is, it's the diversity of the data and the value that you can extract from it that's much more important. I would argue that the Big data for a small telecommunications company might be less volume than the traditional data from a large telecommunications company. It doesn't mean it's not big data. Big data is relative to the organization that is gathering the data. So if you're collecting the interaction data, if you're integrating the traditional, non-traditional data, it's big data. I don't care what the size is of it per se. I do care what is the value that you're going to extract from it, and I think that the tools are not only focused on the scalability, but also focused on the sophistication of the analysis. So the technology that we acquired from the Stanford University spin-off company, Aster Data, is focused on how do I extend data analytics beyond traditional SQL boundaries. Their use of SQL MapReduce, the programming model that was popularized by Google and bringing that to the analytic world within the Astro Data technology is very powerful. And that will work on small volume data or big volume data. The bigness is not the important part. The important part is the diversity of the data and the value you can extract from it. Big data is the diversity of the data and the value you I think that the most important thing about the strategy for a big data program is to get a partnership between the IT side and the business side. Don't make it just a technology project because then you have a bunch of engineers playing with the technology and there will not be value created. It's very important that you have a visionary business sponsor that sees the possibility for the data. How are you going to extract value from the interaction data beyond the transaction data? And, and then IT can work with the business to create solutions that are interesting. But if IT is just on their own or the business is just on their own, you won't be successful. So an effective strategy is really a partnership strategy between IT, the business, and hopefully a solutions provider, a vendor who can bring technology and experience to the table to help build success. 아 어, 이제 마지막 질문인데 이제 빅데이터 하면은 이제 가장 또 빼놓을 수 없는 이슈가 이제 그 빅브라더 프라이버시 얘기일 것 같은데요. 어 이미 지금 스테판 CTO께서도 그 앞으로 수년 안에 디지털 센서를 장착한 기기들에 의해서 수집된 뭐 생활 감시 정보가 많아질 것이다라고 말씀을 하신 바 있는 걸로 알고 있습니다. 그래서 기기가 발전하고 정보가 발전하면서 이제 나도 모르게 감시를 받는 상황이 발생할 수도 있을 것 같은데 이에 대해서 어떻게 생각을 하시는지 좀 궁금합니다. I think there are a couple of issues. One is that clearly some of this data is very sensitive and it has to be protected. 
So that data is, for example, sensor data collecting healthcare data. The hospital needs to have access to the sensor data in order to deliver higher quality healthcare, but that data needs to be protected. It needs to be protected, it needs to be encrypted, and there are a lot of laws and regulations that vary by country, but it's pretty consistent that uh, this data needs to be kept very private. Uh, and, and there are technologies in place to make sure that it, it is protected and, and encrypted. The other part is that in some cases it's about transparency. If I go to work and come back in London, I will have been videoed on average 152 times. And it's transparent. Everybody knows in the subway system, on the streets and so on, there are video cameras and it's for the protection and the security of, of the people because as you know there have been terrorist attacks in, in, in the past so there's a trade-off between sort of the, the privacy and the security of, of the people. Uh, and as long as you're fully transparent that yes you're being videoed. If you get into a cab in Korea there is a video going. You, you, are, you are for the protection of the driver, uh, for the law enforcement, uh, there's, there's video in place, but it's transparent. It's documented, it's clear, there's nobody hiding it. So I think there are two things. Transparency I think is very important. You shouldn't monitor someone and not tell them. You should be fully transparent. And you should be transparent on how that data will be used. The second thing is that some of the data is very sensitive and you need to protect it and, and, and make sure that only those with a need to use that data in the best interest of the individual have access to that information and nobody else.